And hello everyone, so great to have you here. I love to get boaters down to China camp and uh, just thrilled when Chris asked me to speak to you guys as a group. Um, I've had some interaction with some of you here over the years, uh, but it's just a pleasure to be here and have you here. Um, tapping into the, the joy and wonder that is China camp. Um, I also want to just take a moment before he disappears and, and give a, a, a gracious thank you to Martin, who um, was our employee number one is, uh, and, and has lived up to that name. Uh, <laughs> he's done an amazing job. He's like, he's a, he turned the tide for us uh, in, our, in our struggle to keep the place open and keep it alive. And, uh, we just hope he stays for many, many more years to come. He's Thank done you. a great job, Thank so you. Thank you. I wanted to start with this image, because this is the image that, for me, started it all off. I, was, I work at San Francisco Maritime National Historic Park. Been there 30 years. Um, and in my early years, I was finishing my, it was my master's, not my doctorate, by the way. Thanks very much, Martin. <laughs> Love an upgrade, easy upgrade like that. Um, <laughs> But uh, I, was, I, I did an internship where I was able to, I was basically looking through all of our photo archives, and there's many at San Francisco Maritime at, at Building E, looking for images of small boats, because that's my area of specialty, fisheries boats, row boats, uh, sailboats, and um, often uh, there's many images of ships, and ours is really a ship's museum. It started out that way, and lot, all the collections are sort of focused on ships and shipping. So I was looking at ships' images, for boats around the edges, and stumbled on this image, and I was just dumbstruck. It was just uh, San Francisco waterfront, Telegraph Hill in the background, and what is this? Couldn't even believe that something like that was there. I thought, maybe it's crossed the ocean, but it turns out these were San Francisco locals, very much San Francisco locals, the Chinese uh, shrimping junks. This is a larger one, but um, I started in and fascinated with that, and through, the, through that interest, uh, let me just make sure I'm doing this right. I'm just going to say, how's that? Yes. Started to learn more about the subject and realized that throughout San Francisco Bay, many of the more shallow regions were these shrimp camps. Or so, so they're called. That is not China Camp. I believe that's it's actually a reversed photo of, um, it's either San Bruno, Point San Bruno, but my, my, my going guess is the one of the largest ones is across the, the straits here in Richmond, just where the Richmond San Rafael Bridge comes in, a couple points right there. Point there was uh, Point Milati and maybe a little further north of there. Um, and we've done some research to kind of verify that based on some of the other photographs. It was one of the larger ones. And, um, that's like 1890, 1890. And um, you can see there's quite actually a, a, a a range of vessels for everything from small sampans, the smaller boats here, to a rig, big two-masted junk. But the workhorse, and you can see some smaller ones for it, so quite, a, quite an assemblage of, of vessels. So this photo is just amazing. But the workhorse is the one you see more of them. This one single-masted junks here. These were the ones that were the center of the fishery, and there are the, the, those vessels were throughout the bay. Uh, here is one of the primary places. South Bay, there was quite a few, Point San Bruno, uh, even further down near Redwood City, there was a small camp. Um, and they were all uh, out fishing for shrimp. And this is, uh, this is this, basically they were sailing with a single lug rig out to the shrimp grounds. And their nets were staked to the mud in the shallower regions. Long, mile-long runs of nets. They were basically triangular. You can see a picture over on the wall, them laid out to dry on the beach here at China Camp. They're, te they're all, they have big mouth opening and coming down to a narrow bag at the, at the back. And they would basically grab, there's a long line that they tie those into, and they'd grab that line and roll themselves. You can see this long line coming across. I wish I had a laser pointer, but we'll just have to deal with the old time pointer. And um, there's a windlass there at the back, and those guys are rolling themselves along the main anchor line. And as they roll, they, they're clipping up the net, taking it a sh holding on to it, pulling it ashore, getting the shrimp into the boat, and then resetting the net on the other side. So they off, they time their whole exit and entry and, and harvesting to the tides. They look for an ebb tide. That was their go time. And because if you're obviously fighting a big net like that, um, you want it trailing away from the boat. So at the light edges of the tide in the middle is when they'd get out and switch them and and um, lift them. 
Um, and they basically bring their, their shrimp ashore and, and lay, boil it or lay it out in the sun on big drying pads. All these gigantic, this is China Camp, in fact, and this is also one of the earliest photos of China Camp. This is at its heyday, again, around the 1890 period. Um, this is the pier as we know it right here. So you can see there's quite a lot built out uh, from there, and there's also a lot on the other cove. Um, huge, they dry the shrimp, they separate the shell from the meat, bag it both up, then that big two-masted junk would come around, uh, and they'd load it up there and send it into the city. It was loaded onto steamboats, so the China Mail steamship line, and shipped overseas for, as an overseas kind of export product. Million, a million dollar industry in $1890, $1900 going across overseas. So all mostly run by um, Chinese companies out of Chinatown and they'd fund, so it's more of a, they'd fund basically each of these, each of these units and each of the boats would be part of a company. Um, we know a lot about these, this place from census workers and every, every 10 years there's a census and uh, 1890 census Actually, I think it was the, yeah, it was 1890 census. Um, the census taker, for some reason, um, recorded not only that they're from China, where they're from, but actually their, their local region in China. We learned so much. That person, for some reason, just put in the extra detail. So it would be Sam Yup or Si Yup, and you could kind of tell right in China where they're all from. And, um, and then there's also a lot of map making, de detailing which warehouses and which piers belong to which companies. Uh, out, out of San Francisco. Um, so, uh, yeah, this is a fantastic earlier photograph. Things went a little bit awry, uh, to say the least. From 1890 on 1892, there's the Chinese Exclusion Act. There's a very strong anti-Chinese sentiment in this area in particular. Um, it was also kind of a coalescence of the birth of fishery science. So there's early fish and game scientists out checking all and recording all the fisheries and the catch from each. And they were somewhat alarmed by uh, the Chinese methods where the whole bay is basically being filtered out. And they were concerned about the catching of small fish, bait fish. And so they started legislating against the process. Again, that's fishery science, but it's also, I'm sure, a lot of racist uh, competition for resources. And just xenophobia is a very, very different boat, very different style of fishing, which is exactly what attracted me to it, and uh, which is exactly why we'd like to tell the story. And I was amazed after finding the photographs. Here, here's an image, of actually, before I get too far ahead of myself. You can see the photo, previous photo sort of represented in the map down here. Here's Rat Rock. And then you can see the buildings continue right over into this area, full of uh, the piers. In fact, there's more piers here. And uh, well, at this time, maybe it's about the same, but beautiful cove for those of you have, and all of you have, and this is why I love speaking to a group like you, that cove is beautifully still. If, if I had my druthers where I was going to build a house here, that would be the spot. Um, <laughs> not going to get to do that, <laughs> luckily. Uh, of course, you all know where we are, the China camp. I mean, Martin gave you a nice history of, of the establishment of China camp. But long before that, um, here's the, the cove today. And then again, here's Rat Rock Cove, that, that same era, 1890s, uh, which is just mind-blowing when you think about it. Very rich and historical. It's a very protected area, even though we do have a derelict vessel anchored right in the middle of it, which we're working on. Um, it, it's, uh, you can see quite a few companies there. And this photo in particular and, and it was very key to my reconstruction of one of these junks um, with uh, the era. And in fact, the very pier where this boat in the center, uh, as part of my master's thesis, um, this, this, was, um, this is actually an image from the 70s when the park was first looking to open. They did a survey of all the archaeological things. And they were doing a land survey primarily, but it was exceptionally low tides. And the archaeologists on the last day of their survey said, there's something out there. That, that looks like a sandpan. You know? and, um, not sure what it is. Maybe it has a motor, motorized sandpan, but can't do it this time. So for my master's thesis, 20 years later, I, um, I, it was at Ch Sonoma State for cultural resources management, sort of public archaeology. Um, I worked with state parks to, to excavate one of these things as part of my thesis. At low tide, 
<laughs> uh, exceptionally low tide, right about this time of year. I, I think it was a June day. We had about a four-hour window to get out there, and we, we actually, somebody had told us about, um, we were trying to figure out how to get out in the mud. Um, but to backtrack a little bit, that, that imprint was not visible, and uh, Frank Kwan, the fisherman here, remembered it from 20 years before. And we walked out and almost got stuck, you know, almost killed the, the living treasure of Frank Kwan out in the mud. Um, so somebody told us to use snowshoes to go out across the same mud to go out. We did that, and it absolutely didn't work. Don't do it. <laughs> we, we, we spent the first hour of our precious four-hour window trying to extract volunteers out from the mud. So then we just jumped in. We just jumped in, and very carefully, un ex I say excavate. We didn't actually remove it. It's still out there. Shouldn't I have to kill you all after I'm done with the lecture, because you're not supposed to know that. But we, we basically cleared it open and then photographed and documented it um, in a very exhausting but exhilarating day. It was, it was stunning. And it was not long after this moment, me and this gentleman here were at either end of the boat, our boat footprint, and we realized nobody had stood in this boat for over 100 years. Because basically, all of Rat Rock Cove, everything was shut down with all the Chinese uh, the, the, the legislations against the, the fisheries. And by 1910, it was all shut down, and the whole Rat Rock Cove area that you saw in that photo burned. And, burned, and including the boats, burned to the waterline and sank into the mud. So this is a, a waterline vessel, and this is what we drew. This is part of my thesis here. Footprint. And you can see it's right about to the water. These are very shallow draft boats, but a very key piece of the boat to have because it gives you basically the, the plan view. And in there were a few surprises. We found, um, it's hard to tell from this slide, but that's a dagger board box. And that's a mast step. And that was a mast step. If, if you're any of you sailors here, uh, the mast often, our, our western masts have a single tenon that drops into a single groove. Well, here's two grooves. And we're like, what the heck is that? And if that's the mast, dagger board forward of the mast? That's, oh. that's very strange for us. And then another step for something. And so there was more, there's mysteries to be had, and, uh, but we were able to get a lot of information. Wood type, which is mostly redwood with a little bit of uh, long leaf yellow pine in the keel. Really? We got some, uh, some uh, cross sections at each spot, you know, and a few bits of, you know, how, how thick things were going to be. So quite a bit of information, but still quite a bit missing. You, it's tough to rebuild a boat from just that, you know. Hey John, yes. Built here, overseas. built here. They're all locally here, built. Redwood, right? Yep, yep. And redwood, if you remember, uh, and in fact, here's a big piece of redwood right here with the Chinese edge nailing notches, which I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself. Oh. But this was the redwood highway. Scow schooners going up to Petaluma, scow schooners going up to the Delta, building all the piers, shoreside buildings all through the Bay Area, uh, on right here. So they just flag it down. It comes into the pier. They can get some redwood off of it. So. Uh, you know, typical shore town, and they, that's, that was the best wood. And at that time, it was old growth, huge, 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 beautiful quality. And, uh, so were the Chinese building it? Yeah, Chinese were building it. There are some evidence of, of some of the bigger vessels, like the, the two-masted, later, late, late, late period, just as these places are faltering. There was a shipwright that built one down in, um, or at least he's licensed to build it um, down in uh, South San Francisco. But anyway, so you can see photographs above water, archaeology below, it's a pretty good match. Um, and we could piece together sort of from photographs, most of the details above. Um, of course, photographs, this, this industry started 1870, went to 1910, 40 years. So things changed in 40 years, how they built the boats, who built the boats, um, the different size. They tended to get bigger. This is one of the later ones, very large, uh, still single mass. You could see a smaller one behind it. Um, so lots of information, but you had to really pick within the range all the details, but just a ton of details. Very shallow draft. Very, very shallow draft. So you could sail these in two feet of water, two and a half feet of water. Without much control, but you could sail because they have these, these rudders. This one's actually a real large one, but you'll see in some of the other photographs, you could raise and lower the rudder uh, and adjust the depth. Um, so in that, the, the highest position that are kind of available is about two and a half feet, two feet. Did they cross the seams? Uh, yes, they did. Yes, they did. And I'll, I'll get more into it. Before we built, so I, I, I had information from the 
from the photographs. I had some idea for lots of puzzles, but I thought it opportune. This is southern China, and as I mentioned, that census listed sort of where they were all from, which is a small region called the Four Cities, and it's, you see this little inshore area with a big river coming through. This little area is called Taishan City, or Toishan. That's where almost everyone in San Francisco at that time was from. And they were known for overseas ventures and also shrimp fishing in all these little bays and harbors. So I, I got a grant right before, uh, well, to f I finished the thesis and the last chapter proposed the building of a replica. And at this time I worked for the park and I convinced them to, to, to maybe take this on as a project. And so we went I went over there. I'll take questions in a, in a sec. Um, I've got a lot of slides to work through. So I poked around the harbors, and to my delight, wood, 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 wooden boat building was still very much alive. Uh, wood that would, you just couldn't believe, all from like Malaysia and Southeast Asia. Um, mostly motor vessels, but big shrimping vessels. Um, and what, we were, what I was really interested in there was some of the mysteries we had, which we found, you see these little triangular notches along the boards. There's a technique where they edge nail all their planks together. And I wanted to see that. And then we'd read a lot in the history books about, about them bending with fire. And I, I just thought there's a couple ch central Chinese techniques, very different from ours. I don't know if they're there or not. And happily, we d were able to find some of them. Um, this is another area. Wasn't sure. All, we had all these. This is the best photo I had for the whole Stern construction. And I thought, man, maybe there's a, a real live one somewhere. And this was one I found. Um, again, they're mostly into motorboats, but the diamond sh shape diamonds in the rudder. Those are all big questions in the, in the research. Um, but I did find them building, uh, I did go to Toishan area and found them building motorized shrimp vessels, very much the same shape. And here they are, they've, they've notched out little triangular notches with like a little shelf above at the seam, just above. He's drilling down into it and he's setting his hand forged headless nails, they had a forge in the corner of the shop, into those holes and then pounding them down with a punch. And it really ties the whole plank together. So studied that, and that was great to see. Amazing to see they could just walk. I watched one shipwright just walk along a plank, tick, 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 and you see this, bing, this thing fly off, perfect little triangle, tick, 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 bing, tick, tick, tick. And for us, we had to make templates and draw them out. It took like a half hour. It was, it was just the difference between a living tradition and a, and a, and a, 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 a recreation. This is the fire bending. This was also, this is in that giant yard you saw earlier. Um, basically they're hanging, you see a little bar across. There's a little half barrel. They've got the fire in the barrel and there's a little wire to the barrel and they move it along the plank. They put all this weight and here they want twists, these extra bars out with a ton of weight. They're just piling and slowly they bend it to shape, take it off, fit it. So we recreated that once we finally got set up with our project. This is another one of their arrangements. A little simpler, you can see the barrel, and this is a straight bend, so they've got the rocks on the end, and somebody's just out there tending it, um, and it's uh, pretty amazing stuff. This is the one we set up here at China Camp, this is our attempt, with redwood. Now they were using a, a, a wet tropical wood, so they were, the fire was just right on it, and they were going, so we tried that, and poof, there went our, <laughs> there, there went our $300 plank of redwood, um, and uh, and uh, there went my temperature, my, 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 I popped a fuse that day, I think. It was like the one of the only times. And uh, from then on, all the volunteers insisted they didn't want to touch it. And so that was my job to fit, which is really interesting. We could, the cool advantage of this is you could, it goes slowly. We had to spray it down, keep it from burning. We eventually got it to take shape. The cool thing is you can, with steam bending, you steam it, you take it out of the box, you throw it on everybody's all hands. It's kind of chaotic. Get it clamped in a place, leave it. Let it set for a day, and then you come back and see if you can fit it. This way, you could take it off, and once it cools, you could take it over. It holds the shape. Put it up there. No, we need a little more over here. I put it back, bend it. Just a, it was it was kind of it actually worked fairly well for our process. Um, and so then we eventually started laying up over at the other other beach, all the floors, and you could kind of see the structure similar to what we found in the mud. Um, and there it is, some of the floors there, and a lot of details again coming from up above. One of my favorite photos. This is also 1910, very late. Uh, and there she is coming come together under the trees over there at China Camp. Uh, we, we laid the keel in uh, May. This is probably September, and we launched in October. So it was an all-out effort, uh, full-time, every day, 70 hours a week. This was uh, 2003, so it was quite some time ago. Um, 
and, and then finally launched it. And, and again, you can see we had a lot of details to, to pick up and, um, and, uh, and sort of pull together. And so these are some of the larger guys um, that we have to, to pull from. Again, a very late one, Ming Li. And this is actually the one that might have been built by a Western boat builder, um, Anderson and Cristofani, um, late, late in the game. They have some master builder certificates. Um, so uh, yeah, we pulled these. We, this is, I'm going to try and remember why I have this slide here. It's a little out of order there. But um, we were very interested. And in, we, we had to recreate the sail. That took another year or so. Um, and again, here was a lot of critical things. And I want to, I'm glad we came back to this photograph because you can see two little boards sticking up here. That's the mast partner. So the mast, you remember those two little slots in the step? Those slot on either side of the mast, and the mast has a wedge shape down there. And we saw some of that in China. Um, and then a few other places, well, there's the dagger board up out of the water, up out of there in front of the mast. And that was the neat thing. You want to go back to the photographs after finding these surprises in the archaeology. You're like, oh, that's what that is. That's the dagger board. I'd been looking at the photos for quite a few years and hadn't seen that. I uh, wasn't able to recognize it. Um, oop, coming back. Sorry about that. Uh, again, we, uh, we had to recreate the, the sail was another thing. There's obviously nothing left. And we had to really study the battens and the photo, cotton photographs. You can see their nets, huge line of nets that they, they lay out each one. This is a slightly smaller version. Uh, again, a critical photograph for the oars, just pouring over all the photographs, trying to get things accurate, how to lace the sails up. And, um, and there we are on launch day, finally, uh, a big event. It was very well embraced by the, the, the community. Um, and uh, we named it Grace Kwan after Frank's mother who was herself a, a special character. We had the, oh, this is 2003. And there's Frank chopping the line. We had, we had the traditional firecrackers in China. Whenever they launch a boat, they light off a bunch of firecrackers to scare the evil spirits away. And uh, we had a kind of pyromaniac ranger at the time <laughs> who, who took it as his mission, the most incredible loud string of firecrackers you've ever heard. But Frank kept us cool and chopped the line, and we slid the boat in. And um, slowly got her up and running. We, the cotton sail, a lot of handmade, all handmade, except for uh, sailing the bolt together. The rest was all cut by hand, sewn. All the, there's little grommets that lash the battens on. Those were all done by hand, hundreds of hours. And then she began her life as a public boat, going out and, uh, to various maritime events around the bay. And she still does. She comes up here every year uh, in June and stays usually through September. So she's due up in a few weeks. So if you guys get out in your kayaks, I think it's going to be June 16th or 15th. I'll let Chris know. You can put the word out. We're hoping to sail her up. Chris will probably be on board. Uh, we, need, we need a good cabin boy. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know how to make chow mein, right? Um, so I, hope, I urge you all to come down and see her when she comes up. Um, she sails pretty wonderfully. You can see here's the, the, the rudder I was talking about. It can be raised up a little higher and sailed. Um, it's a lot of sail with one sheet to handle, a lot of power. A beautiful thing about the Chinese junk sail is you can lower it. If the wind comes up, you can just, it's like collapse it like a fan, you know. It's almost like a jiffy reef because you just lower it and then these things kind of hold together. You can tie them together if you're worried about it. But very easy to, to get the sail down quick and sh to shorten sail. Um, and, uh, there's still a lot to learn, though. This is definitely where we'd love to have somebody experienced. I think we're a little late in, in how to adjust these sails. Uh, there's a, a line off each end of each batten, forward and aft. And so there's all sorts of ways you can adjust, trim. Um, but uh, so it's still learning. 20 years later, we're still learning. How about the dagger board in the front? How's that? Dagger board, we just uh, generally leave down, uh, yeah. except when we're running downwind, so we're not being driven. And it, it's, it, it tacks. We've tacked. It's, it's, not a, it's not a racing yacht by any means, <laughs> but it sort of outpoints the Alma. We often go out sailing with the Alma. It's a contemporary. And in fact, Jack London wrote about how these outpointed some of the, the boats of the day in 1890, uh, when as he's trying to track, you know, track them down and bring them into, into, into court uh, as a part of the fish commission. He was in a, a sloop, a gaff rig sloop with the centerboard, and he noted that they could sail pretty high for the time.
for the time. It really takes an adjustment. Um, that's the Alma, Schooner Alma, also from the park. Yep, yep. There they are sailing together. And again, I was talking about how they shortened sail. See, they lowered it. There's a couple battens together in heavy winds. And, you know, a lot of things, we built one. We just kind of clawing back some of the history into three dimensions. Um, you know, there's a range of them, smaller ones, and we'd like to consider building another smaller one, perhaps for Friends of China Camp that could live here permanently um, going forward. Nope. This guy's dying to ask a question, so I'm going to... Nope, nope, just in the mud over here. Uh, there might be, and China could be, but China's since 1890s gone through some big, big, big changes, especially yeah. southern China. Yeah. I mean, just catastrophic level. Yeah. So uh, his, there's not a, not a great uh, documentation of their historical belts there and, or the history of the peasant life. You know, it's more about the uh, higher echelons. There's some people that are trying to piece some of that together, but this level, the, the rough and tumble fishermen on the outskirts, that's mostly gone. Other than the living motorboats that are very close, similar size, usually they're um, owned independently, so they have a little cabin. These were really industrial work boats. The, the camps were ashore, very much, and so this is kind of get a little picture of the public life of the Grace Quan. It's been really uh, wonderful to, to be able to share. This is in Sacramento. We sailed it up to Sacramento with the little towboat help course that's a long way to go but we have school kids we have a whole routine this is their windlass so we talk about the 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 the, the power of the windlass even though and get them up doing a tug of war often and uh, yeah you can see the the double wedges on the tapered heel of the mast and uh, I could go on and on about this boat but uh, and we did a replica net but that's uh, that was just the beginnings of one the first ideas of one um, and in fact, before Frank passed, we were really working close to working out the design for the bag net arrangement. That's never been seen. And that's something that we'd like to do further, um, to, to practice setting the nets, practice rolling out, try pulling one or two up, um, because that, that's a whole part of the story that we're interested in, in keeping here is that, which was really the center of China Camp, was the, the actual fishing and the fisheries and the processing. And so we can tell the stories of these guys. Yeah, there's the rudder, okay. And uh, that's up, because that's slid all the way up and resting on the lower, the lower shelf. So they can get that up and get that out of the water for a while. And you see that when out there at the dock too, just keep it out of the mud. But you can lower it through this wooden, wooden gudgeon and the kind of there's really we use it in two different settings you can all the way down or just about halfway down so about a foot or so of depth and it's thrilling we've sailed right in right along the shore right between Rat Rock Co Island and the cove and the rocks in this big boat you know it's like and everybody's like no you don't go no, no. And we're, just like, we're fine see ya yeah yeah high tide generally High tide generally. So this is one of the few photos. And, and you know, this, these are hardworking fellows. And, and that's, I think, recreating and bringing, sailing it and getting in three dimensions, or those kinds of replicas can go a long way towards preserving and telling the story of the cycle of the fishermen and the hard work that, that, that they had to do to sail these things and to work them. I also love the, the bundle. This is the bundle of battens in their sail. And all just the, the different kinds of ropes and it's very comforting as, as somebody who's often has to, also has to preserve yachts for the museum. Like, oh, you know, throw another whatever line you got, put it on there. It's, it's, it's a, there's certainly a craft there, but it's a workboat. It's a through and through. These are hardworking vessels. Um, and as you can see, hardworking sails. They push them to the max. They're, you know, maybe they live 10 years. And I'm not, I still am not sure. I think the transoms here and their planks just, ours has this too, where the planks go past the transom and the rudders kind of slots through that shelf, but these are really high. So lots of variations, lots of room to, to maybe build them slightly differently. I also wanted to put this in because there's their, their tenders, their sampans, which uh, you've, we have very few photos. We've been collecting those up. We've built one. There's one on the beach uh, over there. There's the Monterey had a squid fishing, uh, basically sampan-based fishery. 
And we've built a couple of those replicas at the park. Um, but I'm kind of interested in, in perhaps building some of these here at, at China Camp. Open transom? It's sort of, like I say, the planks kind of go past the, the transom. The transom's inset. Uh -huh, and so yeah. there's this little extra area that really acts as a, as a, a hoisting box for the, for the rudder. So they can oh. raise and lower the rudder and um, protects the rudder. Um, so, but quite a lot of variation there. Um, yeah, this one is um, a yachtsman by the name of Oliver, who was, a, who was just a, an amateur photographer, took a lot of amazing shots of yachts and happenings out on the bay about 1890s, in the 1890s as well. So him, and then there was, a, as I mentioned, fishery science. A lot of these images here on the walls are from, there's a couple studies. There's a federal study of the America's fisheries at the time, 1890s. They're, they recognized it as a fundamental resource, a fundamental piece of the economy. So they, uh, they, uh, with the advent of science, they wanted to have a more scientific approach, figure out what was sustainable, what was not sustainable. So they sent around uh, researchers to document and photograph all the fisheries of the, of the country at that time. And from that, we got a lot of the snapshot of these fisheries. That's half of how we know what we know about the fisheries. There really is, and I, I was a close, close with Frank towards the end, and he died uh, five years ago. And we would go out, okay, he still kept his troller going. So the part of the history, I didn't get the, 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 these fisheries were sort of shut down the bag net. In the 20s, up here in this bay, they opened it up to moving nets, trawls, which happens to also benefit the Italians and Scandinavian fishermen, you know, American fishermen with motorboats. But the Quans also had motorboats and would trawl with these bag nets, one net at a time, with a bar across the mouth, keeping it open, just skimming along the bottom for shrimp. Frank did that and made a living at it um, up till about the, the 90s or you know the early 90s. Then he, he was selling for bait. He wasn't drying them anymore. And I would go out for Frank a little bit in the just before he died, like 2015. And we'd go out for two hours out here, back and forth, and we'd maybe have a handful. And often it was, wasn't the grass shrimp. And uh, Frank said, two hours out there, we'd have 500,000 pounds. And that was 30 years ago. And what happened, a lot of it is water diversion for the Central Valley. Salinity has changed. It's three times as saline as it was turn of the century. So it's all salt. And shrimp are, they, they like the brackish water. So there are some shrimp up the river little wedges, but it's in a very slender uh, navigable waterway, so you know you can't trawl with a can't trawl for them up there. So that pretty much did them in. So uh, you said they dried the shrimp, separated the shell from the meat. Yeah. So is the meat sold for human consumption? The meat? shell for fertilizer? Exactly. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Shell for fertilizer. Um, yes? Uh, what, you said that the southern China, what is the major city there? Guangzhou, Guangdong, Guangzhou to the north, Hong Kong a little to the okay. east and south. Mm -hmm. Have so you it's ever tried to find a John Muir in China? <laughs> 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 Personally, there is a maybe trying to figure out which one. Yeah, we, we talked to, I talked to a couple of universities, and they were more interested in larger, this, the big rage, there was a book about a Chinese armada that sailed around the world, I think it was 1412 or something like that. And that was sort of a big, when I was overseas there, so a lot of the scholars were very interested in the bigger ships and the overseas, you know, which is interesting. You know, it's, it's a political thing in some ways. You know, the, the, the ships tend to have uh, kind of more glory and national stature. And, yeah. But uh, for my money, I love the vernacular, the small boats, the fishing boats that express regional variations and can tell the kind of more human scale story and uh, have a lot of stories associated. And that's what we're, we're hoping to continue to do here. We, um, we bring the Drace Quan up. Uh, we're hoping to um, continue uh, with Frank's shop as a, as a place to build boats and to keep the waterborne history of, of the China camp alive. It's also uh, maybe a spot for some good community boat building activity. But obviously, with the, we, we'd like with the historical bend. And, and there's the junks. There's the smaller uh, sampans attending to them um, and smaller junks. Uh, and as you can see, there's another sampan shot. Uh, pardon me? Oh, yes, yes. That's one we built. That was actually my first go. Uh, that's based on a Monterey squid sampan. Uh, but that's where we first started doing. This was in the early 90s. Yeah, little triangles. We, basically, everything we did on the junk, we sort of practiced here 
practiced it again on another sampan, and then oh. went after it with the junk. Not exactly in that organized a fashion, but uh, <laughs> uh, that was our first grab at the story and the technique. Um, just quickly, so some of our this is uh, some of there's quite a lot of history and the way it transitioned. This the, the shrimp fish, the dried shrimp fishing, the period of the junks um, after it was shut down and the other cove burned. Uh, it really went into it was abandoned for a few years and, and the place went through a, a lot of uh, changes, a lot of decay, um, but was reinvigorated. The Kwan family stayed and, and kept things going. Shrimp fishing, and they even the, although the, the platforms had all shrunk, a lot of, the build, a lot of buildings had been torn down, um, they sort of reinvigorated it. And in addition to shrimp fishing, they would rent boats. It became a sport fishing area, really. They'd come to the cafe. People from the city would come in. You could rent a boat. You could rent a motor for an extra dollar and uh, head out for the, for the day to fish. And uh, lots of sturgeon, striper. This is sort of at the heyday of that period. And uh, you can recognize a lot of the buildings now uh, around us are from this, this more from this era or had been kind of modified. Still a core of the 1890s buildings right around here. The shrimp fit processing, the building across that way, one of the houses down that way. But a lot of the houses have been added onto, and you can see quite a few of them. And here's their fleet of skiffs that they rent. Um, there's a few other visiting vessels. A few of their Monterey's, they're still fishing. Um, became a more of a, uh, the Kwan's were at the center of it, ran the center of business, but there are quite a few little fishermen huts. Some of these buildings up on the, on the bank were lived in and uh, all pitched in. A lot of the fishermen were in Monterey's and go out fishing, drop the stuff to the Kwan's, and the Kwan's would process it and take it into the city as live bait. Um, they did continue to dry well into the 30s or 40s, but eventually kind of transferred more to live shrimp for the restaurants. They had live shrimp here you could eat or freshly cooked shrimp you could eat. Great shrimp cocktails. I'd love to get that going again. Uh, we'd have to import the shrimp, I'm afraid. Obviously, a road comes through and things change quite a bit. But this is, uh, there's some interesting skiffs here. Uh, Frank Kwan share, shared with me that quite a few in the, were purchased from and built over in Rodeo. But there was also uh, at the far end of the beach, God, and they'd been cut off by the slide. There was a little shack where somebody was building some of these skiffs. So um, it's something I'd like to, to do. There's the green 02 out there, which we built by, to Frank's specifications uh, after his little skiff had broken up. So very simple boat to build, but very much part of the continu continuation of the history. So sampan skiffs, maybe smaller junks that uh, could play with some of the earlier variations that we'd seen. Um, it's definitely something we'd like to do. Uh, here it is. Here's the side. So you can see at the far end is a little boat shed um, and some of the skiffs ashore getting outfitted for, for guys, but still, um, yeah, some of the bu very buildings we see now, a lot of them are missing, um, but this one is still there, this one and that one. Those two are gone. And uh, this was a clam digging operation. They would go out for clams, a whole commercial operation that would slide out in, into the mud and clam, um, and they'd get up clams. So. And this is Frank's grandmother's place, and a lot of that stuff disappeared or was falling down when the park took over in the 70s. They documented some of it. Um, they did a great job pulling things down and piecing them back together, a few, few key central pieces. Um, they got rid of a few things that uh, they were sort of weighted towards the 1890s, the, that era, and the, the, the 30s and 40s were pretty recent at that time. So they, were, they got rid of quite a few of these shacks that were still part of that era which now will be very historic, but at least we have a few to keep alive. And I might end it there. I was gonna, I could go on and on about <laughs> ideas for the future. We built a Faluca here, um, another whole other project, but uh, you guys are probably itching to get some snacks and move on to the water. So I can take questions. Well, the one thing I, I haven't exactly, uh, you know, other than, and that's even that holes in the rudder, for example, that's everybody in the West goes, what the heck is that? It relieves some pressure on a big barn door rudder like that. And in fact, I saw it when I was in China on metal shipping barges on rivers. You know, they had little diamonds in there, metal rudders, you know. So it's, it, there's a lot of it that's, it's just um, another way of doing things and that's been there for a long, long time that maybe doesn't 
that just they just stick to a tradition, living tradition. And sort of a simple answer, but that's that's the, when looking into something this different from your own, you know, culture. It, it helps to to bear in mind this. This is a, a lot of people say that's not efficient. Why don't they, you know, why do they should do this this way? But it's it worked well for them for some reason. But the dagger board, the other, I did see there was a, a oyster barge in China, a wooden oyster boat. Same thing. It wasn't a sailboat. It was a motorboat. Same thing. A dagger board. So thought is that it could be something that serves as a tempor very temporary anchor. Fuck, drop your anchor while you work overboard, pull it up, and keep moving. So it could have had a dual purpose, perhaps. Uh, real water, yeah, real shallow, muddy water. You know, what you almost alluded to is an incredible read, Tales of the Fish Patrol. Yes. It is like, I mean, this is like an incredible book, and it's right up exactly what you're talking about. Yes, yes, it's exciting. It's, it's a first hand account by, by um, um, Jack London. Yeah, yeah. Highly dramatized, and I give you a lot of warning about the yeah, <laughs> the, the political things oh, have yeah. changed. Things have changed. He was a man of his time. Oh. When you take that with a grain of salt, it's true. It's quite a glimpse. Tales of the Fish Patrol, and and one of the sources that we use to, and it's inspired me to try to recreate that era um, when you know boat building was sort of at its peak, and everyone was depending on very different cultural, very you know like I love to think about, and part of the reason I built. Faluca here, I can see his, his time face going, John, finish it up. Um, Falukas and junks were out here at the same time, you know, and that to me is, wow, boat from Mediterranean, boat from China, and, uh, you know, the, there's a lot about the contentiousness of it, but I'm sure there was some mutual respect, but the Falukas were drifting with gill nets, the, the junks were stuck in the mud, so I could, I could oh my god damn, you get me your net out of my, I could see where that would be contentious despite, you know, even despite any sort of inbuilt you know, xenophobia or racism, but I'm sorry, I cut you off. Uh, yeah, they, they, all I can, yeah, they caulked even now in China with lots of bamboo fiber, like they break up a bamboo fiber and knock it in. We used, because we knew it, oakum, which is sort of a hemp fiber, um, so, and then they putty with lime and linseed oil. Yes. Would you share with everybody where they could find these great photos and the archives and history? Yeah, well, um, a lot of it, a lot of this one, a lot of, we just, Friends of China Camp just did a cultural landscape report or hired some historians to do it. And for the, we, the, a lot of the images are in National Archives or San Francisco Maritime and Friends of China Camp has quite a few up on the website. But the landscape report, which is available to everyone, cultural landscape report, and it talks a little more about the changes to the buildings. Not so much the water, mm -hmm. but um, all very related, and it encapsulates their history sort of from the beginning all the way up through the Quan period to help us sort of make choices about what's significant, and most of it isn't still. Um, and there's a lot of these photos there, and there's if the online, the digital version, you can really zoom in on it. It's this beautiful PDF file, so you could you could continue researching these things and enjoying them uh, through our on our website, the, the cultural landscape report. For China Camp. Uh -huh. um, All right. <clears throat> I'm really glad that John survived his mud archaeology <laughs> and pulled the mud off. And I, this was just a fascinating talk. I hope we'll have a chance to talk with you a little. If you could join us for breakfast, that would be great. We've got plenty of food. Okay. Um, I'm sure. sure lots of people have many questions. Okay. Um, I'm sorry if I took too much to time. Thank John for an amazing no. presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks so much for all your help today and, and for coming here and being part. So thank you.